So how stubborn are you? <laughs> Willing to stand up for what you think is right, whatever may happen, that you will take on a cause, a product, and you will just stay with it or stay with that idea and that concept. Whatever happened, you'll never give in. How easy do we confuse stubbornness with perseverance or loyalty? We have reached the stage in the study of the book of Exodus where that is the issue. Where there is a major confrontation between God and Pharaoh, between Moses and Pharaoh, and it has all to do with stubbornness and loyalty and perseverance and who's right and who's wrong and, and, and who's going to believe what. Oftentimes, commentators spend a long time at the very beginning of the discussion of chapter 7, which is what we're looking at today, trying to discuss, trying to understand and explain to people who read the commentaries as to why God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And why is it that Pharaoh is so stubborn in this confrontation that he and Moses and he and God are having? And commentators are trying to explain what happened and how it happened and trying to explain this to people so that they can have some kind of a grasp as to, you know, what's this and, and how can we still believe in God because it says that he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and that makes us very uncomfortable because we don't like the thought that God puts people in a situation where they get so stubborn that they just can't get out of it. And it seems that God wants that to happen. Well, today, as we look at chapter 7 and chapter 8, I'm not going to try to answer the question as to what happened and how did it happen. I'd rather try to answer the question as to why it happened. Why did God and Moses together on the, on the one side and, and Pharaoh and his officials on the other side had this confrontation and why they were so stubborn and why both sides were stubborn in this situation. So if you've got your Bible, pick them up, open them on or turn them on. And as we read about this here this morning, about this key moment of confrontation between God and Pharaoh, we want to go back to chapter 5 and chapter 6, which we studied last week. I just want to go back there for a brief moment, for a few verses, to set the context of this confrontation between God and Pharaoh in chapter 7 and 8, and then the other chapters of the plagues. Because chapter 7 begins the plagues, and the plagues go all the way to chapter 11 and 12. So if you've got your Bibles, chapter 5, at the very end of chapter 5, we're told here, as part of the context, that we want to be remi reminded of the initial response of the Hebrews. When Moses came to see them, to tell them that God had come through him or with him to deliver them from slavery in Egypt, to take them back to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the first response of the people, because of how Pharaoh reacts to this is to say, uh, we're not sure anymore. We're not sure. And they are very hesitant, and they don't know if really they're going to follow through with what Moses is offering them. And Moses gets really upset, and he prays to God. Chapter 5, 22. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Pharaoh has doubled the hardship, doubled the number of bricks that they're supposed to do every week, every day. Why have you done that? Is this why you sent me? To cause trouble? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued them at all. When the NRV here ends this at all, which is very American, you know, just to be emphatic. What's going on? Aren't you here? Aren't you listening? So Moses is discouraged. And he prays this prayer. But then the response of God is fabulous and great. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now you're ready. Now you've reached the point 
that you will see what I'm going to do. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will even drive them out of his country. So God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. And in the Hebrew, it's the word Yahweh. And in the English, it's translated the word Lord in capital letters. So the NIV has it that way. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. And there the Hebrew name is the name Al Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Know this, Moses. We've come here together, I've come here with you, and I've sent you here to do something because I said I was going to do it. I remember my covenant, and I'm going to come through. And then notice the number of times. In the English, it comes out beautifully uh, that with the number of times, the expression, I will do this or do that, happens next. Verse 6, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slave to them. And I will redeem you with outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And verse 8, I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord, Yahweh. And then verse 9, Moses reported this to the Israelites. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and the harsh labor. Wow, what a beautiful promise that God is giving them, doing for them here. And the response of the people is, mm -mm, not sure about this. We have no evidence that he's able to do this. In fact, it's exactly the opposite that's happening. Pharaoh is strong. His gods are strong. They're so strong that they've increased the hardship on us. We're not sure that this God that you talk about is able to do this. Oh, my. Moses, it is discouraged. So as we come to chapter 7 today, at the beginning of the plagues, and this confrontation that is now going to climax between Pharaoh and Moses, here's the context we need to keep in mind. The deliverance of the Hebrews from Egypt is a contest between God and Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the oppressor of God's people, and God will deliver them. That's number one. Number two, God wants to keep his word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God remembers his covenant. He wants the Hebrew people to know that. I am a faithful God, and I'm going to do what I say. And number three, God needs to convince his own people who doubt him and who lack confidence in him and his ability and power to really, really deliver them. In fact, in their minds, the evidence leans in the other direction, and he's not able to do this. That's the context as we begin the plagues of chapters 7 to 11. But there's one more aspect of the context to keep in mind and to be aware of as we come to the plagues and the confrontation between God and Pharaoh. And it's the cultural worldview of the time. We're grateful to historians, archaeologists, Egyptologists, and all kinds of other people who were a have been able in the last hundred years or so to dig and to find all kinds of artifacts to help us understand the religion of the Egyptians and the religion of the ancient Near Eastern people at the time of Moses. This is in the background of this story here. And to understand a little bit of this adds a different picture to the entire story. You see, Egyptians and Hebrews, who had lived in Egypt for now a number of hundreds of years, at that time did not think about God's earth and heaven the way we do. Their world has a totally different cosmology. Egyptians and other ancient Near Eastern people believed in a pantheon of gods, each of them responsible for different aspects of their earthly life. 
There are gods of their various forms of water and springs and rivers and seas, gods for life, for plants, for fields, trees, harvests, gods for the rain and the moon and the sun and so on. There are all kinds of gods. And each of them is supervising a particular aspect of life. For the Egyptians, at the top of this pantheon of gods, there is one god, the sun god, Ra. And Pharaoh is the son of Ra. Gods are also ascribed to geographical areas of the world. There are all tidbits of history here. And these gods dominate the people of their land where they live. Another god would not be able to come and interfere in what's happening in a particular god's place and geographical area. You can't do this. Gods stay where they are. They belong to their land. And it's unthinkable to think that a god from somewhere else will come and challenge a god of a particular place. And even, even less, the gods of the Egyptians, who are the most powerful gods on earth. You can't do this. One more thing that we learned from that archaeology and history is that Egyptians also believed that the gods had ordained all human social order and status. And this is determined at their birth. So, at birth, a slave is born a slave, because this is what the gods have predetermined. A priest is born a priest, because this is what the gods have preordained, and, and so on. There is no need to aspire to a different class status, because this is what the gods have preordained. And human beings are not to challenge the gods and their ordering of society. If they do this, they'll only get trouble, and lots of trouble. And like in the heavens, with the pantheon of gods, where the sun god Ra is the supreme god on earth, there is a son of God, and that's Pharaoh. And he's at the top of the human hierarchy and the social order, and nobody challenges the son of God on earth. Nobody. And if you dare, you're into trouble and lots of trouble. And so this Egyptian cosmological worldview explains in part why Pharaoh is so dismissive with Moses and Aaron. Who are you? You're sons of slaves. And you dare to come into my presence? and ask for your people who are slaves to be freed, to change their social status? Who are you? And Moses dismisses them. He refuses to listen to them because of the world in which he lived. He is at the top, and nobody challenges Pharaoh. Nobody challenges the gods of the Egyptians because nobody is able to do that. Wow. This worldview also explains in part the doubtfulness and the reluctance of the Hebrews to trust Moses and the word that he comes with from God. They have lived in Egypt for so long. They have imbibed, they have absorbed so much of that culture of the Egyptians that they have come to believe that they're slaves and they're going to be slaves for the rest of their lives. That's it. That's the social status that they have. This is what the gods have predetermined. And this is it. What, regardless of what the God of Abraham from far away may be saying, nothing is going to change. This is the way things are going to be. So the stage is set, so to speak, for a major confrontation of stubbornness. A big confrontation between two gods. A big confrontation between a slave people aspiring to freedom and a people with all the social privileges. And so the story of the plagues in chapter 7 to 11 is the story of Yahweh, the El Shaddai of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob coming to a foreign land, Egypt, the mighty land of Egypt, a territory where he does not belong to deliver his people from another God's land and slavish custody. It's a confrontation between Moses, the son of a Hebrew slave, the spokesperson of Yahweh, and Pharaoh, the son of the gods. 
So you find Yahweh here challenging the predetermined order of the Egyptians. And you find Moses and Aaron challenging the predetermined order of Egyptian society. Yahweh and Moses are about to destroy much, much more than what the plagues are going to harm. Yahweh is about to destroy their universe. Yahweh is about to undermine their worldview. Yahweh is about to crush whatever they hold dear. Yahweh is going to do a big, real big thing that the entire Middle Eastern world is going to talk about for centuries. Wow, this is big. So if we read the story with this worldview in the background, then the story takes on a new meaning. And most of the modern objections we have and the doubts we have with this repeated claim that it is God who hardens the heart of Pharaoh begins to melt away. This is a story that was written for the Hebrews to meet their objections to God, Yahweh, to respond to their doubts and reluctance to trust Him. Their questions are not our <coughs> questions. And so our story begins. Chapter 7, verse 1. Follow along. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. He is a stubborn man. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions and my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out. Notice that Yahweh sends two ambassadors here, Moses and Aaron, to go to Pharaoh. And we're told here that Moses is presented as to be similar to a god to Pharaoh. Not that Moses becomes a god, no. But the, the status he takes on is no longer the status of a son of a slave. He is now almost portrayed in the eyes of Pharaoh as being a son of God, just like Pharaoh is said to be a son of God. So there's a similarity that happens here. And because of the miracles God will do through Moses, Moses will come to be perceived at this almost as a god. So there's an indication here that you've got a battle between two equals. And this confrontation, God predicts that Pharaoh will not listen to Moses' repeated request to let the people go. Why not? Because God will harden his heart. Now this statement, yes, it's repeated many times. It has been difficult, and it's been a stumbling block. Because how can God be fair if he hardens Pharaoh's heart? How can such a maneuver be consistent with God's integrity of character? Isn't this completely unfair and, in fact, manipulative? Is really God like this? So to us, and given our views of justice, integrity, fairness, equity, this story makes no sense. Why well, we don't like it, at least. And a lot of people have wished that somehow these little tidbits of phrases would not have been put in the Old Testament, in that story. But I say, wait a minute. What if? What if something big is going on here? What if God has a specific audience in mind to convince them of who He is? Notice again verse 5. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. When I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is the most tangible thing that Yahweh can do to convince the Egyptians and the Hebrews that he is more powerful than any Egyptian gods. Not only will the plagues undo and destroy the power and the influence of many of the gods of Egypt, thus showing that Yahweh is more powerful than they are and that He is able to invade their territory and deliver His people from slavery. But the plagues will also tell everyone that God is controlling even the mind of the son of the gods, Pharaoh. The Egyptian god Ra 
is not even able to control his own son. Yahweh controls him. Yahweh makes him fulfill his own purposes. Talk about power and might and real deliverance. Would you trust such a powerful God who is even able to control the minds of the other gods? Wow. In the end, all these manifestations of God's power through the plagues and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart will convince the Hebrews that Yahweh is really their God and that they can and must trust Him to deliver them. So the first demonstration we have right here in chapter 7 of God's power before Pharaoh is Moses' staff being thrown to the ground and transformed into a poisonous snake. A feat, by the way, that the Egyptian magicians are able to copy. And of course, this is not going to convince Pharaoh if his, if his uh, own Egyptian magicians are able to do the same thing. And we're told that in a number of the other next plagues that come up, the Egyptian magicians are able to do the same thing. So they don't convince, therefore, Pharaoh that God is really that powerful. But we're told here, that there's a spiritual conflict between Yahweh and Pharaoh that begins slowly but surely to increase, to reveal who's the superior God. One by one, the plagues will challenge various Egyptian gods who control the life along the Nile River. Each plague will build up in intensity and with challenges. And one by one, these gods and powers will have to yield their might to the might of the God of the Hebrews. By the way, if you've got the Andrews Study Bible, and I suppose all of you students, you should have one, probably in your dorm room or at home somewhere. If you open it and you go to the pages for this story, chapter 7, 8, 9, at the bottom of one of those pages, you will see a table of all the Egyptian gods that are challenged by each one of those plagues. It's very well done. It's very insightful. A lot of gods are being challenged by Yahweh and by Moses. And the same goes for Pharaoh who's being challenged. This powerful king who claims to be the son of God is even controlled by Yahweh. He cannot make decisions by himself and his gods are not helping him at all. So the first verses of chapter 7 are God's prediction of what is going to happen. The plagues and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart are the fulfillment of this prediction. But then notice... One more important detail given repeatedly in this long narrative about the plagues. At the end of the very short story about Moses' staff transformed into a snake, the narrative concludes with this. Chapter 7, verse 13. Right after Aaron's staff swallowed up the other staff, turned into snakes. Verse 13, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. That phrase, just as the Lord had said, is repeated many times in the next few chapters. It next appears at the end of the plague of the water turned into blood of the Nile River at the very end of chapter 7, verse 22. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. We find the same statement again at the end of the plague of frogs, and the plague of the gnats, both in chapter 8, and then again at the end of the plague of boils, and after the plague of hail, both in chapter 9, and then at the beginning of chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, we are told the final reason why there is the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Here it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, chapter 10, verse 1, Go to Pharaoh. For I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may perform these signs among them that you may tell your children and your grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them and that you may know that I am the Lord just as I said would happen. Yes, 
There's the other reason for the plagues and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. We know that God could have done one huge miracle at the beginning of this confrontation. This confrontation did not need to last a few weeks like it did. It could all have been resolved within one day. Within one day, when Moses came back to Egypt and talked to the Hebrews and went to see Pharaoh for the first time, God could have done one miracle. I don't know which one, but God could have done one miracle like he did, in, he does, will do later in other books of the Old Testament, and that would have been it. And the people would have left Egypt and would have got you know, to Canaan as proposed and as planned uh, without a hitch. Everything would have been fine. Everything could have happened that way. God has enough power to do this. But why is it that it's taking so long? That there is such a confrontation and the confrontation goes over so many days and so many plagues. Well, we're told why. The Hebrews were not that convinced that God was their God and they needed conviction. And how do you do that? Well, you've got to unravel the way they think about God and the way they think about the gods of the Egyptians, and you've got to do it with them. And one by one, all these gods are challenged and crumbled and, and come to nothing. It could not be done in one day, also because the Egyptians were unwilling to yield to God's power and authority. And not only was Pharaoh challenging this God who interfered in his territory until the end because he believed that he and his Egyptian gods could defeat Yahweh. And the Hebrews themselves needed more conviction. So this repeated phrase at the end of some of the plagues is emphasizing the message that God is fulfilling his promise and his prediction. He said it would happen that way, just as the Lord had said. God knew Pharaoh would not listen, would not keep his word, would continue to challenge him because he's stubborn. This would be a confrontation between spiritual powers much beyond what is visible to human eyes. This repeated reminder of God's foreknowledge serves as a reinforcement that God is here in control of what is happening. The Egyptian gods and even Pharaoh are being overturned. Each time it is repeated, the phrase implies these questions. Do you believe now that Yahweh wishes to deliver you and to make you His people? Do you have enough evidence now that no gods of Egypt can withstand Him? Are you observing and understanding what's happening? God is here. He's come to deliver you. Yahweh knew ahead of time what Pharaoh's response would be. And God would use his stubbornness to make the defeat of the Egyptian gods even more spectacular and convincing. <laughs> Yahweh knew that Pharaoh would continue to challenge his authority, thinking that his gods are more powerful. But in the end, Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods are disgraced, totally humiliated. And the entire ancient Near East world would be talking about this for generations because of the God of the Hebrews and what he did. The story of the Exodus and the plagues is the record of God's faithfulness to his people. It is about God keeping his word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, rescuing his people from slavery as he said he would do. And this deliverance is forever celebrated among the Jewish people with a Passover. The confrontation between God and Pharaoh need not have happened. Pharaoh would have known that the Hebrews had been there for a number of generations and that one day they would go back to their land. They were strangers. He would know that and that one day they would return. This confrontation is much more than the mere stubbornness of two gods fighting each other. It is a deep spiritual conflict between forces of good and evil, a conflict against God's people that continues to this day. In this story, we see the evidence that God is powerful to save His people and that He keeps His word. There are some days, I'm sure, when you feel the same way, when you may also wonder, when I also wonder, where is God? Where is the evidence of God in my life 
why isn't God just intervening right now to help solve this solution or problem, you know, that I'm having, that I'm facing? And we may doubt, wonder about God's presence and God's faithfulness. This story, like many others in the Bible, serves the purpose to remind us that even if things are dark or doubtful around us, and even if the future is unknown to us and we really doubt about, about what's coming next, God knows. God knows. And God will keep His word to His people, to you and to me. This story invites us to trust and to have confidence. I may be stubborn and not want to yield sometimes, but this story tells me that God is stubborn as well, and He will keep His word in the end. That's good. There's a good side to be stubborn when it is God who's stubborn on our behalf. And I like this. Let's pray. Father God, oh, we're grateful for this story, difficult story at times, yes, perhaps, but it teaches us, Lord, to have trust, confidence in you. We may not know the future, that's true, but if we know you, we are in good hands. Oh, Lord, Father, grant us your blessing. Grant us a desire to trust, to have confidence, and to do that step of faith that you invite us to do, just as you said. Thank you, Lord, and send us now with your blessing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.